Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, TV Raman, and this is my office mate, Charles Chen. And we hack together, code together, so we also talk together, hopefully not at the same time. Um, and hopefully the phone won't talk while the two of us are talking, too. But uh, this talk is about building eyes free interfaces on Android. Uh, we are calling it looking beyond the screen. That doesn't mean you hold your phone like this and look at, look at the world over it. It's basically building user interfaces that go over and beyond the screen. Um, the stock is uh, structured into two halves, where the first half, I'd like to walk you through some of the thought processes we went through in terms of coming up with some of the UI paradigms we are trying out. And in the second half of the talk, Charles will sort of walk you through some of the libraries we are open sourcing that actually allow you to bring some of this UI coolness into your own applications. So let's go, start working through the various sections of the stock. Um, the first section of the talk, I'd like to focus on what it means to sort of be someone who does UI research and UI implementation in the mobile world. Because I believe this is distinctly different from the last 35 years of human-computer interaction that have gone before. And you'll sort of see why I think that in the next few slides. But we are all geeks here. We are developers here. Let's sort of celebrate our geekdom for a minute by sort of looking at that phone that we all have and understanding why that's an engineer's dream. Obviously, that phone is more powerful than the, uh, than the desktop workstation I had 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, obviously, this thing can do a lot more because it's connected to the network. Those are enablers. Uh, the third enabler that you have, obviously, is building cool user interfaces that help surface all this coolness to the end user so that they can actually use it. So in that sense, what does it mean to build innovative user interfaces for the mobile world? Um, let's ask the question, what is a user interface first? I didn't include that particular slide in the talk, but many years ago, I used to carry around a slide that was a very simple slide that sort of explained what I thought of as the user interface. Um, if you pull, up, pull away specific implementations of a user interface, such as a GUI, such as an X-Windows desktop, a Windows desktop, a Mac UI, there is something fundamentally simple about the UI. Um, it's about human-computer interaction, as Kai will tell you. But then that, again, has become a buzzword. So there's the human and there's the computer. What is this interaction we are talking about? The human-computer interaction that makes up the user interface is really about two things. It's you, the human, communicating your intent to the machine. The machine computing on that intent and coming up with some answer and grabbing your attention. So I used to draw a little diamond with the human on one, one vertex, the computer on the other vertex, and sort of draw arrows saying intention, attention, input, and output. So from you goes input to the machine to convey your intention, comes back as output and attention. And so if you take that view of user interaction, UIs that you build have to fit into the user's mode of working, not the other way around. So this is about bending technology to our will. And an open platform, especially in the mobile world, is extremely conducive to doing that because now the only thing that blocks limits how much you can hack is your imagination. So you have all of the peripherals you want. You have way more peripherals than what we've had in the past. And that's one of the most important things about doing mobile user interfaces. Um, let's talk, go to the next slide about eyes free interaction. So clearly, there are many, many cool things you can do as you innovate along the UI axis. Uh, the specific thing that Charles and I have been focusing on is using this, these phones without looking at them. No, this is not just about the blind user. This is more to say, how do you use these devices if you are not capable of, willing to, or not in a position to look at the screen? And that completely changes your perspective on how you build such things. Um, the, those situations are obviously many. Um, you might be driving. You might be walking along the corridor talking to your friends. There are many situations where you do not want to hold your phone like this and squint at it. Um, I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was walking down one of the uh, corridors at Google with my guide dog, and my dog suddenly swerved. And I asked Charles what happened. And he said, that was a lucky save. Somebody almost walked into you. I said, 
that was an interesting response, right? It wasn't I walked into someone, it was somebody almost walked into me. Well, the reason somebody almost walked into me was that person was holding their cell phone like this, doing email. <laughs> this was not safe, right? I mean, it's, cell phones aren't just a hazard when you're driving. I mean, if you start using cell phones like this, you, know, you, need, you need to get tickets when you're walking, too. So how do you avoid that? <laughs> you know? so, so I think um, ice-free interaction is, is really about fitting into the user's life. Technology has to sort of come to that point where we are able to do that. So let's sort of go to the next slide and ask what is so cool about these new phones that let you do all these things. Um, one reason I believe that sort of the GUI hasn't really evolved beyond what Xerox PARC built in the late 70s is that the peripherals available to the GUI designer have not evolved since then. Doug Engelbart invented the mouse, PARC invented the bitmap screen, and the rest is history. And sadly, history is all we've had, in that the GUI has not changed. Yes, people have worked on how to lay out menus better. People have learned how to cram more things into that limited real estate. But the fundamental peripherals with which you interact with a graphical user interface have not changed. Look at that phone and count out the peripherals versus what your laptop has. Your laptop has a display, a monitor, a mouse, um, a, a microphone and a speaker, and perhaps a webcam. Um, those latter three, the microphone, the speaker, and the webcam, are actually quite awkward to use on a laptop, especially the laptop. Look at your camera. Uh, look at your phone. It's a camera. It's a keyboard. It's all of these things. But now think of it not as all those devices, but think of it as your computer in your pocket with the ability to sense the world and see how many more ways it can sense the world as opposed to your laptop? Simple example, there's, there's a you know, mobile scavenger hunt being announced today. There's a piece of paper stuck on the wall with a QR code. You can just walk past it, point your phone at it, get a URL, and start browsing it. Isn't that cool? That's because your phone has many eyes and many ears by which it can sense the world. And the more it can sense the world, the better position your phone is with respect to getting a handle on your intent, on your intention as a user. And the cool thing about building mobile user interfaces, and this is maybe a little contradictory to someone who does user interfaces as their be-all, end-all goal, is you actually minimize user interaction. So in the desktop world, it was always cool to make the user interact and then build newer, more powerful widgets and gadgets with which the user interacted. With your mobile devices, I believe we need to go one step further, which is user interaction is cool, but wouldn't it be even nicer if your device could do what you wanted and show you what you wanted before you went and interacted with it? Because you are not taking your phone out of your pocket in order to interact with the phone. You are taking your phone out of your pocket to interact with the world. You're taking the phone out of your pocket to find out where to go have dinner. You're taking the phone out of your pocket to go talk to your buddy, not to interact with the phone. So this is really what is cool about building innovative user interaction on mobile phones. You are really focusing on how shall I minimize clicks? How shall I minimize screen switches? How shall I minimize context switches? And how shall I help the user get his work done? So uh, let's go to the next section of the slide. So as a case study, I'd like, you, like to take you through two things that we've built. Um, you can actually see um, YouTube demos of this on the Eyes Free Android channel. Um, what I'd like to work, we will do demos during the session, but what, I'd re what these slides are really about are sort of walking you through the thought process that went towards coming up with these solutions. Because I personally, when I see someone show me a thing, they've shown me a solution they've come up with, I often find the process by which you get there more interesting than the eventual artifact. And um, hopefully that applies in this case too. So the problem we were solving, the specific problem that we solved last September was I wanted to start using the Android phone as my primary phone because I believed that that was the only way I would build the right user interaction environment that matched my needs and the needs of ice free interaction. So uh, the Android phone is a nice smart computer, it's all of these things, but 
the reason you first put it in your pocket was because it's a phone. And many of the smartphones I'd had before it did a lot of things, but they were so complicated to use that I stopped making phone calls with them. And to me, that was a problem. So the first thing we worked on was, how can I use the phone eyes free? Um, so this is an interesting question. You could, you could have sort of punted on the interesting problem here and said, well, it has a keyboard. Pull out the keyboard and dial it. But that's inconvenient. And as I said, if I had done that, I would have joined the club of people walking like this. And I promise you, I would definitely walk into things if I did that. <laughs> so, so the question was, how do you actually use that touch display and do things with it? Um, common wisdom said, if you cannot see, you cannot use a touch screen. Um, and so the way you sort of debunk myths like that for yourself is to go ask the question, why? You know, two-year-olds ask the question, why, incessantly. I think we as developers, geeks, and scientists need to ask that question the whole time. So why is it that most people believe that you must be able to see in order to use a touch screen, to use an on-screen keyboard? It's very simple. How do you use a touch screen? There are two atomic acts involved in activating an on-screen control by touch. You need to look at the screen in order to locate the control. Then you need to go push it and get some feedback for having pushed it. Clearly, if you're not looking at the screen, you need feedback at both levels. And the showstopper that most people stumble on is, well, you can't see it at all in order to see where the button is if you're not looking at the screen. Therefore, you cannot use it. So let's, let's ask the why question again like a two-year-old, right? Why do you need to see the button to know where it is? Well, because the button is positioned in a fixed place. You need to know where, dummy. Well, why is it positioned in a fixed place? And the answer immediately emerged as well. It needn't be in a fixed place. When somebody chose to put it in a fixed place, it was in a fixed place, right? So the other way to think about it is, rather than you looking at the screen in order to find the keyboard, what if the keyboard came and found your finger when you put your finger down. So the opposite of absolute positioning is relative positioning, and that's what we built. So the, this, this is what we call a stroke dialer. We did a very, came up with a very simple idea, saying wherever you touch is the center of the phone keypad. Okay? Put your finger. There it's five, there it's five, there it's five. Ah, but now you know where five is. Well, if you know where five is, you know where two is. You know where one is. You know where nine is. So we, this very simple insight of asking the why, irritating why question many times gave us a very simple answer. So the next time your two-year-old asks why, don't yell at him. Answer the question, and you'll probably find out something. So um, I'll let Charles do a quick demo of the stroke dialer. Um, what is interesting about the stroke dialer with respect to its feedback is that it actually gives you auditory feedback in terms of sound cues. Um, it speaks the number. And it also vibrates. And all of those are synchronized. And that's a big, big win with respect to doing the user interface correctly, because it gives you a whole sense of realism. You know, if, if for in, so this is an interesting thing about the real world, right? If I take a coffee cup and put it on a table, it goes, it goes click, and it gives you force feedback on your hand. The table resists. If, for instance, the table didn't resist, you would drop the cup. Um, if you didn't hear the clink when you put the cup down, you would feel something was wrong. And the same applies to building a touchscreen interface where you're doing auditory Nine. output and touch. One. One. So, no, so obviously you heard the auditory output. One. Um, you even heard Delete. a little Nine. bit of vibration because it's on a wooden table. So, so, th this, so th this is sort of an interesting exercise with respect to doing a stroke dialer. And later on in the talk, Charles will actually show you how you can actually use this as an overlay in your own application. So the thought process is nice. Showing you the thing working is nice. But being able to plug it into your own applications is really the, nice, is really the icing on the cake or you know, the icing on the Swiss chocolate or whatever you want to call it. Um, let's flip to the next section of the slide. Um, at this point, you're probably saying, yeah, yeah, big deal, but nobody dials phone numbers anymore, which is true, right? You don't dial phone numbers anymore. You use your contact manager. Um, so how do you do a contact manager for an ISP environment? Um, so this time, you're going to do letter input instead of numbers. 
and obviously you have to sort of maintain contacts, do all kinds of things. Some of the problems we actually w w danced around here because of the way um, Android works with the cloud, and it's actually quite cool. Um, some, some hard problems are best solved by getting rid of the problem, and that's what you will see with respect to editing contacts. But let's talk about um, modifying the stroke input idea in order to input letters. Now, there are many ways of using a touch screen and using your finger to input letters, right? There's graffiti. There's many, many versions of graffiti. Um, all of these systems you can actually think of as two steps. I'm going back to the intention. You have an intent. You're communicating to the computer idea. You want to come up with an encoding that is easy for the computer to process. This is why graffiti was invented as opposed to human handwriting. So you want a, a, a thing that is easy, unambiguous to recognize via an algorithm. And you want to come up with a mapping that is easy for the human to remember. Right? So I could come up with a set of strokes that are very easy to recognize for the computer but requires extra learning. And uh, you know, early days of the Apple Newton showed us that people just give up very quickly. They don't learn a new system. So I do, we don't claim that what Charles and I are showing you here is the world's best encoding system for from strokes to letters. But it is a system that's worked for us. And it actually works particularly well on the Android screen. Um, so I'd like to show you that. So this time, instead of thinking of the phone keypad, think compass directions, magnetic compass directions. So you have north and south, east and west, northeast, southwest, southeast, northeast. So I intentionally set those in pairs. There are eight of them. Let's think of them as four pairs of two each. Now, you know, you sort of think about it. There are about 26 letters, you know, eight, four, do the math, you know. Let's say we put eight letters on each of these, for each of these pairs. And let's sort of think circles, OK? So let's think circles. And since this is a Google, Google I.O. talk and a Google, Google algorithm, let's think of it as four colored circles and let assign the four Google colors to them. Um, let's put uh, letters A through H on the first circle. Let's call it blue or whatever. Um, let's put the next eight letters on the second circle, the next eight on the third, and the next eight on the fourth. Now, we remember we have eight compass directions, uh, four sets, right? Let's use the north and south pair to enter a circle. Let's use the east and west pair to enter a different circle. Let's use uh, the diagonals to enter the other circles. And the way the circle dialer that we've done works, the circle keyboard, whatever you want to call it, the way this guy works is that you stroke in any of the eight compass directions, and that gets you into one of the four circles. Then you trace along the circle till you get to the letter. Now, since you can enter each circle in two places, so the north or the south, or the east or the west, think of it as entering either at the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle. Um, this will all get obvious as Charles starts showing it to you. So Charles, let's show them how we do an A. So now remember, the first circle has A through H. So A is just an upward diagonal stroke. Phone book. A. Now, notice that it said it in a woman's voice. It finalizes it when he picks up his finger. OK? Uh, it's also in his contact manager, so it's actually jumping to contacts that start with an A. But we'll talk about that soon. So A was very easy to do. Now A through H are on the same circle. So to do a B, he would do an A, a. trace along, a. and pick up his finger. No contacts found. So he doesn't have any contacts found in that letter. Now, so A, A B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Now if he wants, once you get used to this input system, to do an H, you obviously don't go around in a circle like a dark. You actually go the other way around. So you go from A to H in one step. A. H. No contact. Now, supposing you wanted to do an E. You could start at A and go all the way around from B to C to D to E. But we don't do that. Because remember, we have two, two points at which we can enter the circle. 
So we enter directly at E. So the downward diagonal is E. No contact is found. So, so now, you, now you see the A through H circle working. Similarly, going up or down gets you into the second circle that has I through P. So you just go down. I. There you go. J. K. L. M. M. Mom. Sal. <laughs> So, so now, now we, this is how we are, what we are using to filter our contact list. So we did the simple thing of you do, a, do you do a letter that jumps you to the first contact with that letter. You do one more letter, we sort of take that as additional input and continue filtering. And uh, so the, the thing you realize with this is that you get to your contacts in about one or two gestures. Um, each letter of the alphabet is no more than three steps away. Right? So if you wanted to do a C, you go A, B, C. So uh, that's about the longest. Because if you want to do a D, you go to E and go back to D. So you get very good at this very quickly. And the color coding sort of helps you to learn it. But once you've learned it, you do it without looking at it. And the contact filter thing is very, very nice because you can really filter through your contacts very rapidly with this. Um, flip to the next slide. So finally, the thought about the best way of solving some hard problems is to get rid of them. How do you edit contacts? Um, it's best not to edit contacts on the phone. <laughs> Nobody does that, right? Most pe how, what do you do typically if you want your friend's phone number? You say, could you call me so I get it in the call log and I can, add, can, I can add you then? That's right, right? So that's how we all do it. Well, um, because Android talks to the cloud, there's an even better way of doing it, which is just to use your Gmail contact list. So I actually edit all my contacts online, um, and it shows up on, my, on the phone, and that's great. And if I meet people at events like this, then I do the age-old trick of, oh, please give me a call, and I'll add you through the call log. Um, so that's how we do contacts. Charles, can I have a bottle of water? Oh, sure. And actually, it's my turn now. Exactly. So. That's why I wanted the water. So, and, uh, so we, from here on, we'll sort of go to all the technologies that we use to implement all this. So I'll let Charles talk about the TTS library, the gesture library, and all kinds of good stuff. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I just have a quick question before I start. How many of you saw the keynote yesterday and the TTS demo? Awesome. Now, how many of you here you know, are interested in writing TTS apps or have written a TTS app or you know, currently working on one? Wow, this is f fantastic. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, developer interest is very important. And the interest that has been shown to the TTS library so far has been one of the factors in getting TTS into a base platform. So give yourselves a round of applause. And uh, so with that, with that being said, um, you know, we don't, it's going to come in donuts, but for right now, if you want to get a head start and start working on talking applications, the APIs will be very similar. We're actually involved in working with the Android team and porting it. And uh, what you're going to get is you're going to get a head start and you can start developing your apps and start playing with this by using our currently uh, released text-to-speech library. And uh, that's what we'll be talking about for the rest of the session. So on, the, on these demos now, what you hear is eSpeak. But as developers, go ahead and write your code. When Donut comes out, you will just get a better voice. And all your apps will just sound much better. Okay, so uh, let's get started here. So the TTS library. So this is something that enables developers to create text-to-speech enabled apps that talk to users. The way it works is that as a developer, you go into Eclipse and you compile against the uh, library stub jar that we've included on our developer site. And text-to-speech is an Android service and we have a, a TTS class that acts as a wrapper uh, to take care of all the messy iBinder stuff. So you just create it like a regular Java object. You just do new TTS, and uh, you can start using it by doing tts.speak and some text. And uh, part of the beauty of having this as a library that gets reused is that the TTS library can be updated without you necessarily having to update your app and it also enables multiple apps to share the same TTS service so the user doesn't have to uh, install it multiple times. And once it goes in a platform, then everyone just gets it. So uh, let's look at some of, the, you know, some of the main features that we have. 
uh, there's a very simple, easy to use speak function. So it takes the string of text that you want spoken, a queuing mode, whether you want to speak immediately and flush any text that's currently uh, waiting to be spoken, uh, or if you want to queue it up, and then some, param some additional parameters that you could imp have. Uh, there's a stop call, because otherwise your application may talk and never stop, which would be kind of annoying. And, uh, and you can also check the current status, whether or not it's currently speaking. So if you're trying to synchronize uh, some on-screen display, you can synchronize it with uh, where you are in the speech. And we also have methods that let you s synthesize to a file. So you can get an audio file that you, know, you can set as your ringtone or something. Um, and you, know, you can s specify a language so you can do translation apps, talking translators, all that good stuff. And the current behavior of the text-to-speech engine is that it will automatically prompt the users to install the TTS service. And if it's absent, you can set it to just fail silently so it won't bother the user, or you can just have it automatically redirect the user to market where they can download the current TTS uh, service. Uh, for more information and uh, you know, to check out our source code, this is all open source, free, so uh, please take it, and we look forward to see, seeing what you can build with this. And uh, you'll see the URL there, eyes3.googlecode.com. And uh, that's where you can get all the source, all the jars, everything. And so with that, let's, uh, uh, I'm, go I'm going to dive into an example of this later in the talk. I'm going to talk about the gesture library right now and give a brief overview before I start on the, co on the coding tutorial. So the gesture library, that's what uh, Raman had discussed earlier. Uh, he, you know, he had shown the uh, stroke dialer and, uh, con and the contacts uh, input method. And so both of those use this uh, gesture library that recognizes very simple strokes. Now my Mac is uh, not behaving. There we go. OK. So uh, this is an overlay that watches for touch events. So it will tell you when the user has touched down the screen. Uh, when they're moving around on the screen and when they lift their finger up, so you know which position they finished at. And it will tell you the identified gestures. So you can actually see the gesture uh, as the user's making it, or you can just get the final result of, well, the user stroke the diagonal up. And uh, this exposes the same UI as the stroke dialer to the user. And we implemented this as a custom view. And this is a custom transparent view that you can layer on top of your applications. And so this means that you, know, you can do your UI however you want to, and you can just overlay this on top, and it won't have any uh, effect in how your view renders. To use this, what you have to do is you have to implement a gesture listener. So you create a touch gesture control overlay, and you start with a frame layout as your base view. So what you would normally have as your view you set that as the first child of your frame layout. And I have an example of this later on in the talk. But uh, if you do that, then what you'll get is you'll be able to layer this touch gesture control overlay as a child on top of that. And then you can enable or disable the gestures by adding or re removing that view from your frame layout. And so uh, with that, let's uh, jump into the heart of this presentation and look at a tutorial with some real code. And so uh, I'm going to uh, demonstrate a simple music file browser. Uh, how many of you here have gone to uh, andev.org? It's a website with developers and code examples. Cool. So uh, they actually posted a very nice uh, file browser tutorial uh, when Android first came out, uh, you know, how you can explore the SD card system and look at what's there. So uh, we took that, and we show how in just a very few lines of code, you can add both text-to-speech and uh, gesture controls to it. So this is a very simple music file browser. It lets you uh, browse directories on your SD card and play MP3 files that it finds there. And you play the music by just clicking on that file. And the directory path is the first entry. If you click on the directory path, then it just cycles through all the MP3s you have in that uh, subdirectory. And uh, as you scroll through the list, you get some tactile feedback so you actually feel like you're moving through a list. And so now I'm going to uh, explain how to add spoken feedback. So you first start off by creating a TTS object in method on create. 
and this will cause it to run the text-to-speech as part of its initialization. And then you can add some ad application-specific logic there so that your application comes up talking. So let me just uh, switch over to Eclipse and show you the code. Okay, so uh, this is the music file browser, uh, the base music file browser before we added anything to it. And uh, let me actually demonstrate that first before going any further in this talk. So uh, it's the first music file browser here. And uh, you see the contents of my SD card. I can scroll through it. And you know, nothing's talking, but um, you know, it works. I can go to MP3s. And uh, you know, I can play a couple of popular songs like this. Okay, enough of that. Is that popular? I, I think it is popular on the internet, at least on YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so uh, let's see. Now, let's see if we can make this a little bit better, a little bit uh, more interesting. And, uh, you know, let's see if we can make this talk. So, oh, okay, I need to switch back to my Mac here. And, um, okay, so what you just saw here is the basic music file browser. And this is just the tutorial that was on andip.org that uh, we modified a little bit to handle the playing. So where we made the modification is down here. You know, we added a uh, toggle playing function. So, uh, so we did that. And the other thing is we added some uh, tactile feedback to when you scroll through the list. So if you look at here, we have this uh, on track volume. Event. All right, how's the font size for everyone? Can you guys see it okay? No? Okay, let me uh, zoom that a little bit. Okay, so now we're better on uh, text size. Okay. So here is where we added our uh, vibration control to it. Uh, aside from that, it's the same basic file browser. So let's see how can we add speech to this. So here is the version where we've added speech. And I've uh, helpfully set breakpoints so I can find all the places where I added some code. Uh, there's not that much code, so the breakpoints are pretty useful. So uh, we added a line to uh, here to create a TTS object up here. And then we have a TTS initialization method. That this will get called whenever the TTS is created. And so you see when we start it, we helpfully announced that, hey, music file browser started. And the onCreate uh, method of your uh, app, we have now this uh, TTS, new TTS, and uh, we've set the initialization listener to TTS init listener. So this, this is what causes our init function up here to get called. And then, uh, then it's pretty simple, right? Now, you know, earlier I had mentioned we had this uh, vibration feedback for when you scroll past certain items in a list. Well, so we can actually latch the text-to-speech functionality on top of that. So instead of just vibrating, what if we vibrated and we spoke uh, the directory or the music file name? Well, that's, uh, that's what we ended up doing. So uh, if you look down here, ta-da. So uh, there we have a TTS speak uh, file name substring, and uh, we just speak it there. It flushes right away, and you can, as a result, you can hear what you're scrolling to. So, uh, so let me uh, demo that version. Okay. Music file browser started. So there. Uh, so now, so now you always know when it actually started up. And then now I can scroll through. And on your own, phone, on your own phone, it won't talk, talk so loudly to you. Yeah, it only talks as loudly if you put it next to a microphone. DSIM, download, DSIM, down, SD data, MP3s. Okay. The voice you hear there is eSpeak, and as I said, this will, this, you know, over time, you'll have multiple voices available to you that you can choose. Up one level, portal, still alive, dot MP3. This was a trial. Okay, so cool, huge success, right? So, uh, 
So uh, okay, so so let's uh, let's kind of see what that actually meant. So uh, so so you saw all the code that I added. Those couple of lines. Uh, that was that was it really to get TTS working. And so if you if you actually go back and count, so all so these slides will be available, and our code is already available on our uh, Ice Free Google Code project. So uh, I challenge you all to go back and uh, download this code, check it out, and actually do a diff and count the number of lines. Because uh, the diff, you're, you're gonna find that it's really just verting lines of difference. So adding, a, and this includes you know, import statements, just you know, generic boilerplate things, right? Like adding uh, a closing brace, that's a line. So it add, we only needed to add verting lines of code, and uh, we added full text-to-speech functionality to this uh, music file browser. So, uh, so this, is, this is nice, you know, now you have a talking music file browser, but what if you wanted to use this while you were jogging or something, right? It's not going to be very convenient for you to uh, jog and try to use the trackball. That's going to be a little bit uh, difficult. It's probably much easier if you could just do some gestures on the screen, scroll through what you wanted. So uh, you don't want to jog with the trackball because the trackball will keep jogging and nothing will ever be stable. So it's, you really don't need something else. Exactly. So uh, so let's uh, let's add the gesture input method to the music file browser. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the gesture overlay is a transparent overlay, and you can just over you can just put it on top of your existing content views. And this won't interfere with your visual ap appearance at all because, hey, the whole thing's transparent, right? So you add this to handle user input, and we're going to add two very simple controls. So we're going to say when you tap down the screen, that's play or, or pause. And if you want to uh, gesture towards the right, that means you want to just cycle to the next track uh, in that directory. So, uh, so this is the type of code that you have to write. It's fairly simple. You start off with a, g a gesture listener, and oh, whoa! Oh. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so yeah. Anyway, you didn't miss much. Uh, it was basically just it's just code here. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Can we get, give give this guy a piece of chocolate too? <laughs> My God, you're behaving like Don Knuth handing out gifts for bugs. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, so yes, uh, gesture listener. So uh, we're going to do, uh, we're actually doing something very simple because we're just going to do tap to uh, play or pause, and we're going to do a stroke to the right to cycle through the next thing. In both cases, we actually don't care so much what the user is doing as they're making the changes. So this on gesture change, we can leave it empty. We don't really have to implement it. And then uh, all we care about is on gesture finish. So if they finish their gesture in the center, then that's a tap. So we do the play pause music code here. And if we see that the gesture is a gesture to the right, then hey, it's a stroke to the right. That means we should go ahead and play the next uh, track in that directory. And we don't really care about when they start the gesture because you know, we're not doing anything that's timing related here. Now to put this into your uh, app, what you have to do is you should take your main content view, put that inside a frame layout, and then make your frame layout the main view. So this way you can switch your overlay on, on and off by just adding or removing it. And then to toggle it, then it's pretty simple because all you have to do, to, if the overlay is active and you want to disable it, you just do a simple remove view and it's gone. And then you can touch the screen and uh, interact with it as if you didn't have gestures. And then if you want to uh, turn it back on, you just do add view, and suddenly now you get this transparent overlay on top, touching it becomes gesture inputs, and you won't trigger anything in the view underneath it. So let's look at what this, uh, what this code looks like here. So uh, here is our on gesture code. This is what I had just shown in the slide earlier. And uh, as you see, we didn't need to worry about gesture changes or gesture starts. We just look at how the user ended their gesture to determine what they did. And the main change that we had to do was over here. So over here, notice how now I've created a uh, my frame object. That's a new frame layout. 
I'm adding the my list, which is the content view, to that frame layout. And then I'm making this uh, gesture overlay, which I'm currently not putting it in yet because I didn't want to start off in, in that mode. And then I set my content view for my app as the frame layout. So, uh, so, and so then the frame layout manages everything else. And finally, uh, I had to add a on key down event because you know, sometimes you do want to switch between the two modes. You might not always want to be in gesture mode. For example, it might be nice to be able to just click down on a directory to drill down into it. So in that case, you don't really want that to get treated as a tap. So to switch back and forth, I'm using the uh, menu key. And using a menu key, you swap it on, swap it off. So, uh, so let's look at this final version here. And this time, I'll remember to uh, switch. Yay. All right. To the home screen. So now music we, file browser started. Okay, so now we have the music file browser. So uh, it started off without gestures, so I can actually just click on the screen. I could list, so it, that works. Now let's say I want to just uh, start playing using gestures, and I don't want to care where I'm tapping. Gestures activated. Gestures activated. Okay, so let's stroke. This was a Right. So, thank you, thank you. So uh, now if you look at uh, what, what that actually amounted to, again, I challenge you to go back and do a diff and uh, verify this, but uh, when we did this, we added about uh, 40 lines of code, and that was it. So adding 40 lines of code, you get this gesture thing, and it just works for you. And uh, so with that, I will hand it back to Raman for the conclusion. Okay, thanks, John. So as uh, Charles said earlier, all of these libraries are open source as part of the ice free project. Feel free to use it. Feel f even, even better, feel free to contribute patches, contributions, innovations. Um, in conclusion, I believe uh, user interaction research in the mobile space, especially for devices that can see, hear, and sense the world is a very, very exciting area of research that's opening up. The mistake we shouldn't make is to try and take the 30-year-old GUI from the PC and push it into the mobile device. I think that would be a disservice to all of us. Um, I think these devices can be, do much better at sensing our intent based on what they sense of the world, what they sense of our actions, what they sense of our history of actions. And they also have many, many ways of grabbing our attention from the type of work I do, speech output being my primary sort of uh, biggest thing that I'm interested in and work on. Voice on Android, as you heard yesterday during the keynote, voice output is going to get a lot, lot better, thanks to our friends from Zurich. Um, so in conclusion, I think there's a lot more stuff to build here. All of you even have the phones to build them on, so come hack with us and let's have a great time. And at the end of the day, let's build technologies and user interfaces that bend those devices that you have in your hand to your will, as opposed to you having changed, having to change how you work and play to match those devices. Um, let's flip to my final slide, uh, which is my usual Q&A slide. That's my dog flying a 767. So if that's possible, anything's possible. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, now we're going to take questions. So uh, please don't be shy. We don't bite. We only buy chocolate. Yes. I have two questions. Sure. Is it easy for hands defender to change the voice? I think the, the voice is pretty. So. Uh, so that's going to be a donuts question because that's going to ship with the donuts platform. And uh, what I would like to point out there is for right now, the text-to-speech library, it's just a library that you can get off market. So you can get any TTS you want off there. And we do want to make it a pluggable TTS architecture. So you can use our default TTS voice or you can use some other TTS voice that you, that you prefer. But our default will sound pretty darn good. Okay. And the second question is, is there any global settings menu that application vendor can 
check the settings value and automatically enable these kind of features? Uh, so I, f I think you're a little bit uh, confused here about enabling this feature because the way it works is this is an API. So this is going to be just like, you know, uh, using the accelerometer on the device or something like that. The user doesn't have to explicitly turn on the accelerometer. It's just there. You just code to it. You write a function call, and uh, it works. Uh, yes? How would you um, inform the user of this functionality, especially the gesture functionality as being there in a consistent way? So that's, that's a good question. You're asking the question of discoverability, and that question is in general, one of the hardest in the mobile platform. So all of you are holding those dream, uh, G1, G2 devices. Um, do you know that holding down the home key, a long press on the home key brings up a list of six, their last six used applications? I discovered that today, nine months after having a phone. Right? <laughs> so you ask a good question, do I have an answer to that? No. Um, I believe, though, that over time, um, we need to, we will come up with gestures that are sufficiently intuitive that people use it. There will be some learning involved, there will be some word of mouth involved, you know, um, and if it is really useful, people will over time discover it and learn it. That's the best answer I have. I don't believe the, the PC desktop GUI answer to this is, which was, you know, everything shall be made discoverable by cluttering the screen is going to work, unfortunately, in the mobile space. So I, if you have, that's a good research question to answer. We don't have an answer to that. Uh, yes, Clayton. Where do things stand with routing synthesized speech out over the, a phone call? Is that now possible? Routing synthesized speech out over a phone call? Um, I, do not believe, I do not believe I know the answer to that yet. I could check on that for you. OK, thanks. Uh, yes. Um. Hi, are you also working on uh, speech to text? Like, is it possible to input speech? So currently in Cupcake, there is a Reco API that you could use. Okay. There's a Reco API. You can, over time, you will also be able to use an IME that is speech input. That, that work is being done by many people at Google, including the people who do voice search. So that is being worked on. It's, worked on. it's not directly us. So that's not part of Donut. Sorry? Will oh, that be no, part no, of the, the, the voice search part is part of Cupcake. Okay. It's already, it's already out, out, there. out there. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, well, uh, thank you all for coming out here. And it's great having you. Back. And you have a good one.